Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Update. It's the 22nd of August, pretty quick update this week. So as always, you can jump to the update you care about the most. New videos this week. So I dived into Microsoft Fabric. It obviously brings lots of the different data capabilities across one standard format. Uh, one lake, which is a Delta Parquet. This means now I can use different types of data integrations and uh, tooling and notebooks without having to copy and translate my data between the different solutions. So I avoid having these silos of information. I don't have data duplication, which then I get data drift. Well, now I can easily stand up a regular transactional SQL database. It's all the kind of SQL auto scale goodness you love, but you literally just type in the name and your database is there, and it's gonna be integrated with the analytics capabilities of Fabric. And then I also did a video on the new ability to use managed identity with Azure File Sync. So Azure File Sync says, hey, look, I've got my regular Windows server-based file shares, up to 100 of them, and I want them to synchronize content via a cloud and Azure File Share. Well, now I can use managed identities for all of the different authentication the server endpoints to the sync service and the server endpoints and the sync service to the Azure file share. So it makes it operationally simpler, but actually more secure. So on to what's new on the compute side. So I don't normally talk about private preview things, but what's nice about these new uh, DC and EC, so they're confidential VMs, they're using Intel TDX. That's the trust domain extension. And what that means, for us, it's a whole VM encryption. So most of the regular Intel confidential compute solutions, they give you a secure enclave. But to use that secure enclave, I have to change my application. Well, with this, because it's a whole VM encryption, I don't. My app just works as is, but now I get that encryption in use capability. Obviously the DC is general purpose, EC is memory optimized, and that's about the virtual CPU to memory ratios. They have Azure Boost, so I get huge storage IOPS, huge storage throughput, huge network bandwidth. They're up to 512 gigabytes of memory, so that would be up to 128 vCPUs for the DC, and up to uh, 64 vCPUs for the EC, again, because it has a higher ratio. I've covered this before, but they must have made an update because I can now use Azure Bastion to talk to and manage my AKS cluster. Remember, Azure Bastion is that managed jump box capability. Well, now what I can do is I can leverage that to communicate with both my private and public AKS clusters and run Kubernetes commands. So I can do an AZ AKS Bastion. And then once I've done that, I can do kubectl, et cetera, et cetera. Azure Functions has a new 512 megabyte instant size for the flex consumption plan. So this is a new smaller size that I can still use the 2048 and the 4096 memory size options, but it basically gives me a new option to optimize to only pay for exactly what I need. There's also a new set of diagnostic settings for flex consumption. So I can collect the application logs and the resource metrics and you send it to the usual suspects, uh, Log Analytics Workspace, Storage Account, Event Hub, and then there's partner solutions that kind of trigger off of the Event Hub as well. On the networking side, so the App Gateway Max Surge support has gone GA. So Max Surge is all about when I'm doing an upgrade. So I do a rolling upgrade of the instances that make up my App Gateway instance. And ordinarily, if it's replacing an instance with a newer version, I get a drop in capacity. Because if I had four instances, for example, well, one of them is going to drop out as it's being upgraded, it gets drained and replaced. So I'd only have three actually serving the traffic. So I get a drop in the capacity. So what Max Surge does is it provisions new instances. So I maintain the level of capacity during the upgrade operation. So it's going to put in a new instance instead of taking an existing one kind of offline. So I maintain the capacity I have. This is automatic. I don't have to do anything. There's no configuration required. It's automatically enabled. Now, because it's adding some new temporary instances, it does use some additional IP addresses. So just during upgrade situations, it's gonna use more IPs from the IP space. If you do not have a big enough IP space, then it can't do this. So it would use the traditional non-max surge method. 
storage. So Azure Files Premium um, Provisioned V2 Billing Model is GA. And actually, that's kind of a misnomer. I shouldn't talk the word premium in there. So the big deal here is I did a video on this before. And Azure Files Premium um, now has this capability in addition to standard. So it's not just premium, but premium is kind of, I guess, the newer thing. So this is the ability to use the new billing model. And now I can use it for both the premium, the SSD, and standard HDD, but that was already available. And the whole point of this new V2 billing model is I can now individually provision the storage, like capacity, IOPS, and throughput. So I can exactly match my requirements. Maybe I need a really big volume, but very low performance, or I need a small volume, but very high performance. So I can tweak and turn those dials and pay for only what I actually need. So this is gonna seem very familiar if you've used a premium SSD V2 or ultra disk managed disks, because it's basically following the same model. It also lets me have volumes up to 256 tebibytes instead of 100 tebibytes for premium, and I can do four tebibytes for standard all the way down to 32 gigabytes. Um, the Blob Archive tier is now available in Mal Malaysia West. Remember, Archive is all about it's keeping the data, but it's not available online. I have to bring it back out of Archive into cold, cool, or hot. So there's a rehydration period. I make sure I have to keep the data in archive for a certain amount of time where there's kind of an early deletion. But the archive is really useful where I don't need immediate access to the data, but it has to be retained for a period of time, maybe compliance purposes. Uh, Azure NetApp Files Flexible now has call access in preview. Remember, Flexible lets you separately configure capacity and throughput so you can exactly match requirements. Well, now I can also have the idea of a, a call for my less access data. And so what this will actually do is go and move it to Azure Storage. So Azure Storage is a cheaper cost. So this call tier is really, hey, that least access data, I'm gonna move out of Azure NetApp Files and I'm gonna go and put it in an Azure Storage account. Also, Azure NetApp files, the file access logs have gone GA. So this is detailed telemetry for the file access activities. So for the SMB volumes, NFS v4.1 and dual protocol volumes, I can enable this, not for the NFS v3 volumes. So it's gonna give me information like the identity of the entity doing the operation, the actual operation type and the timestamp. Each entry is about one kilobyte uh, in size, and I can enable this on a per volume basis. Uh, the log analytics search jobs now will return up to a hundred million results in a result set. Remember, a search job can work across the various tiers, including that long term tier. It's one of the ways I can get data out of the long term tier. Well, now it's going to return a hundred million results in a result set, up from one million. Um, Microsoft Sentinel and Microsoft Defender for Cloud are being retired in the China cloud. So that's one of those sovereign clouds. So 18th of August, 2026. So this is the cloud operated by 21 VNet and basically based on evaluations that to be able to continue running these services at the required levels of protection and reliability, it is just no longer feasible to operate those. So if you're using those services in the China cloud, i.e. the cloud operate by 21 VNet, then you need to go and look for alternate solutions before they are retired. And finally, this is a reminder. I've mentioned this before, but it's really important you take action if you're using the C name based domain control validation because it's being deprecated. And so if you're using that and you don't take action, well, your certificates won't be able to renew. And certificates are kind of important to the functionality of most services because otherwise I can't talk to them. So if I'm using app service managed certificates, if I'm using content delivery network, if I'm using Azure Front Door Classic or Azure Container Apps, check your certificate renewals. And if you are using the old validation method and you're seeing issues, take action because you need to meet the new multi-perspective issuance collaboration requirements to be able to renew your certs. And that was it. Uh, as always, I hope that was useful. Until next video, take care.